okay. And so usually we're in person, but no one gets to see it. Now we're not in person, but somehow we are in person. Don Bergman, how are you? I am just terrific, and it's uh, great to see you face-to-face, -face, even though I'm not seeing you face-to-face, -face, but I am yeah. seeing you face-to-face. -face. It's like a paradox. So uh, this is the uh, audio files, and we've got a good one. We've got a number of folks that we can talk about because we're going to talk about the 27 Club. Uh, oh. this is, yeah, this is not a great club. No, that's not a club we would want to be members of. So this is all uh, musicians, and there are others that are also in this club. We're going to focus on the musicians. Um, that unfortunately passed away at the age of 27, uh, and all the folks that we're going to talk about, ha uh, you know, were in at least in part due to addiction, if not uh, totally due to addiction. True, and then there's more of them than you think. You know, as we look at how deep all of this goes, and we've kind of been exploring that, uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, the members of the 27 Club are quite numerous, and that's only the people that died at the age of 27. Indeed. And so as we uh, have uh, always done with this, this gives us the opportunity, uh, me meaning music gives us the opportunity to talk about addiction. Uh, and so it is these well-known uh, musicians who are just a few of the folks that happen to pass at age 27 that we can focus on, uh, although the age doesn't matter. And uh, also the uh, what? Uh, their job uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> they happen to be musicians. So let's line them up. So you've got uh, Robert Johnson on the front end. Uh, right there in the middle, you've got Jim, Jimmy, and Janice. Uh, then we'll go to Kurt Cobain and end with uh, Amy Winehouse. So stepping in the Wayback Machine to, to Robert Johnson, uh, there's a debate whether it was alcohol or poison that killed him. Uh, but uh, you know, we know that uh, it was the alcohol that kind of helped uh, put him in a position where he was uh, hitting on a, a friend's uh, woman, uh, and that's maybe why he got uh, poisoned. Yes? Uh, so rumor has it that uh, there was poison in the alcohol he was drinking. He was handed a, uh, uh, a bottle of alcohol that night, and uh, a couple of days later, he was dead with strychnine. So, you know, I think you mix some strychnine with alcohol, you've got a deadly combination. But alcohol itself can do the job, and Robert Johnson, in his genius, uh, was also known to be somewhat of a heavy drinker, or so the legends have it. Uh, and you know, when he made his deal with the devil, the devil could very well have been pouring alcohol down his throat to get him to sign on the dotted line. Uh, there you go. So, uh, and who is the devil? And maybe there is uh, actual voodoo religion involved there. There's uh, some interesting reading to go along with it. But um, really what, what sits him at that bar that night is that kind of um, elevated ego, which we've discussed before. Yeah, that's correct. We talked about you know, the fact that we addicts and alcoholics, of which I'm one, um, you know, in recovery, uh, that we have this uh, sort of uh, ego, we're egotists with inferiority complexes. You know, it takes that alcohol, that drug, to help us feel normal and help us to feel okay. And then, and then we also think it fuels our creativity. And you take somebody like Robert Johnson, who you could feel, you know, his emotions in his music, that, uh, you know, you, when you think how that stuff does get fueled, you can see the power of the addiction, the power of the, of the drug, the power of the alcohol. Yeah, there is something else driving him in his playing and in his singing. You can feel that. That's right. Talk, talk about voodoo. Talk about the devil. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so let's leave uh, Robert Johnson there. We'll, we'll go to... Uh, Hi, <laughs> we'll go... <laughs> We'll go to um, uh, more familiar uh, folks to you, uh, Jim, Jimmy, and Janice, right? You remember them. That's right, uh, Morrison Hendricks and Joplin. Right. So, so here, there's almost a cocktail at work here. Who knows exactly what it was? We, we do know that addiction was in play here. Um, there there's a, a kind of a cultural thing uh, at foot here, too. How would you kind of set up those three? Well, think about the, that time in the later 60s when all was free love and kind of free everything else. Uh, and, you know, as they 
uh, we're looking for ways to experience the world in a new way and in, in sort of this new way of freedom way, you might say, uh, considering that, you know, I was kind of a kid then, but, uh, you know, I was aware of what was going on. Uh, you know, the, the idea of taking psychedelics, uh, that certainly was uh, kind of part and parcel of the whole flower power and free love movement. Uh, but when we got into darker things like alcohol, like heroin, always looking to take things to the next level, you know, once we get the drug into our system, those of us who are addicts and alcoholics, uh, you know, we continue to take it to a further and further and further place. And, you know, with, with Janice, it was heroin. You know, she was uh, uh, big into heroin and, and uh, you know, she died of an overdose uh, alone in a hotel room. And uh, with Jimi Hendrix, it was just, you know, one drug too many. He was famous for just taking handfuls of whatever was handed to him. Uh, and that particular night, it was a bunch of barbiturates that did him in. And uh, I believe he ended up asphyxiating because he was in a practically a coma state as he's choking on his own vomit. Uh, and uh, we lost another genius. And Jim Morrison, uh, the cause of death was listed as a heart attack. But that was after many years of uh, heavy drinking uh, and drug abuse. Uh, you know, sitting in a bathtub somewhere in Paris. Yeah. What a lonely and sad way to go. And think about that. They've also went in lonely and sad ways. You know, Janice alone in the hotel, Jim uh, alone in the bathtub, uh, and Hendrix, I guess, with a girlfriend, but uh, uh, done in by yet one handful too many. Yeah, and it seems like for each of those three that the the search uh, was out you know kind of looking uh beyond oneself for the answer and as we've d discussed with uh george harrison um he said actually uh eventually uh, you know i'm i'm actually looking within i don't i don't need drugs to find that search which brings us to kurt cobain who it, it seems like was looking within um, but one shot uh, of heroin too many, and you are messing with shots from a shotgun, it seems like. That's right. He did a, a you know, he, he suffered from a number of things. It was clear that he was a man in pain in a lot of ways. Supposedly, he had a lot of uh, gastro issues. Uh, he had a lot of, you know, things that were causing him pain physically. Um, and his addiction, you know, he turning to heroin to help relieve the pain, uh, including his pain of living, uh, because I know he struggled in his relationships uh, with Courtney and with parents and with uh, uh, other folks. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of tortured genius thing, uh, there's nothing like a shot of heroin to relieve the torture uh, at least for a short period of time. And many times that, uh, that dosage, that shot of heroin or just enough to drink or just enough to uh, dull our thinking enough to think that, say, another way out is a good idea, ends up often in suicide. And we see that so many times, you know, we see that with uh, people that, you know, crash their cars into telephone poles, like uh, Chris Bell of Big Star did. Uh, we see uh, other folks who hang themselves, like Pete Ham and Badfinger after a night of drinking uh, with someone else who's in despair. Uh, and there's Kurt Cobain with his shotgun. Uh, and now no more Kurt. Uh, these, these tortured geniuses, in pain, whether it's physically or emotionally, uh, they have not found a spiritual solution like George Harrison did. Mm -hmm. They're finding solutions, permanent solutions, uh, through overdoses, crashes, and, uh, and other forms of suicide. And, which brings us to, to Amy Winehouse. I was young uh, when uh, Kurt Cobain uh, happened. I was not as young when Amy Winehouse happened. 
Um, it seemed inevitable. It seems like it, it, it almost could be considered the, 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 the saddest one based on the fact that we had all of these examples leading up to it. It's, uh, it, it seemed inevitable because you could see the behavior. Um, it's, I, I watched that documentary called Amy and it seems like there was nobody in her corner and, you know, what do you do with this one? You know, it really makes me sad because we watch these car wrecks happening, right? We, we watch people right in front of us, you know, Whitney Houston, she's somebody, she's not in the, she was older when she passed away, but everyone saw her destroying herself. And there's Amy, young Amy Winehouse, young, vulnerable, you know, clearly someone who was fragile in so many ways and so popular, yet not getting the support that she needed with her alcoholism, with her addiction. Yeah, she did rehab. She wrote, she wrote and sang about it uh, and, you know, expressed herself, expressed the pain that she was in, uh, yet she didn't get the help that she needed. And for her, there was just one way out, you know, and it was like that last drink of vodka finally shut down her system. So, you know, you have that level of toxicity in your body over a period of time. And during that period of time, you're not getting the help you need. Uh, if I didn't get the help uh, that I needed when I had my very public meltdown right here at this uh, this company that I work for, uh, I'd be dead today. And I was in the I was uh, very close to the Twenty Seven Club. It's this actually rings very true to me, Seth, because uh, I was realizing I uh, was kicked out of the rock and roll band I was in at the age of twenty seven, and. I became filled with despair and fear and felt that my life was over because my rock and roll career was over. Uh, and I was 27 years old and I don't know what kept me from the fate of these other folks because I drank and drugged heavily for two more years and fortunately I found the help that I needed. But, you know, here you have 27-year-old folks in the prime of their lives, in the prime of their creative years, uh, and they're no longer with us because of their addiction and because they didn't get the help that they needed. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I can't, it, it's hard to uh, speak of the pain of that and the sadness of that that I feel because I see that happening around me all the time. Well, let's let's then you know end maybe with a solution because you mentioned the song rehab and you know the lyrics go, uh, you know they say that uh, I should go to rehab. I'm paraphrasing. They sh they say I should go to rehab and I say no no no. So you know first off when you when you heard those lyrics what did you think and if you had the opportunity to sit down with with Amy at the time what might you have said. To, to kind of change that outcome? Well, I was, you know, when I had my own meltdown, I was, I was in such a level of pain that I was willing to do anything. So uh, going to rehab sounded like a good idea to me. And I know she had been through rehab and she, she fought it. Um, and that happens to us when we're in that level of denial, you know, but you know, she was also, we have to keep in mind that she was in the middle of this extremely successful career with all those people around her pushing her forward, keep moving, keep singing, keep writing, keep recording, keep playing. Um, and what I would have told her was, if you really want to do those things, sometimes we need to step back and step away and get back in touch with who we are. Uh, and I will tell you that I'm almost certain that she forgot who she was. She lost who she was. Kurt Cobain lost who he was. Uh, Jim Morrison lost who he was. Hendrix, uh, Robert Johnson, uh, everybody we've talked about today lost who they were. How do I know that? Because I lost 
who Don Furtman was or who Don Riff was when I got booted out of my band. Um, and uh, it took intervention, it took help from other people, and in my case, from a higher power, just like George Harrison, uh, to ultimately find out who I really am. Yeah. So the, the, the key lesson here is that you can't do it alone is what it sounds like. If, if you're really, you know, uh, that far down in, in terms of addiction, you're going to need some, some extra hands. I think that that is an extremely important point that we do need help as uh, uh, as as a, a Beach Boys song once said that sung by Blondie Chapin uh, on the uh, on the album after Holland Carl and the Passions was the name of the album you need a mess of help to stand alone that is perfect that is a, a great way to end Don Furtman you will never stand alone as long as I'm around I appreciate your time as always and I can't wait for the next one Thank you, Seth. Thank you so much.